Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Madeline and this is Made with Books. And today's video is about 30 books I want to read before I turn 30. Uh, I mentioned this in my goals video for 2019. I am turning 30 this year in September and there are a lot of classics and a lot more that are not on this list that I would have liked to have read by now. And seeing as I have studied both German and English literature, I feel as some of these are a bit embarrassing to reveal that I haven't read them yet. But that's probably silly and uh, just my personal opinion. Nevertheless, fingers crossed, um, uh, my favorite German professor and former employer does not find this video and uh, realizes how many uh, of the books I should have read by now I haven't. <laughs> um, so yeah, I sort of sorted the books into um, uh, different countries uh, from where the books are or the authors that wrote the books. And I'll just get into it. So I'm actually starting with German classics. And the first one on my list is Friedrich Schiller, Die Räuber, which translates to The Robbers. Um, this is a play and it originally uh, was put on stage in 1782. And it was quite the sensation back then. It debuted at the Mannheim Theater and it caused people at the time to think of Schiller as the German Shakespeare. So I've read other things by Schiller. He's one of the really important uh, German authors. Um, he lived partly alongside Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And uh, yes, I really finally want to get to this. So this is one of the books. The next one on my list I have seen talked about on booktube before and that is Erich Maria Remarque Im Westen Nichts Neues which translates to All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, this book was published in 1929 and it deals with the First World War uh, from a soldier's perspective and it's basically about this soldier trying to keep his humanity amidst the chaos and horrendous things that are happening in World War One, So I think this is going to be really harrowing and, and touching and I'm definitely looking forward to it as well. Um, then I have two books by the same author and I should have really read this by now. Now if you are from Germany you know what I'm talking about. Um, the, and they are both by Thomas Mann. Um, and the first one is Buddenbrooks which is one of his big novels. Um, Buddenbox was first published in 1901 and it's basically about the rise and downfall of, uh, the fam of a family. And uh, that's also the subtitle of the book actually, The Decline of a Family. And I have started, but I've <laughs> barely made a dent in it so far, it's quite chunky. Um, I have read some of Thomas Mann's shorter work, but I haven't read his big novels. And so this is the one I am starting with in January. The other Thomas Mann novel that I have yet to read is Der Zauberberg or The Magic Mountain. And this was originally published in 1924 and it's set in a Swiss sanatorium. And apparently it's sort of, the whole novel is sort of telling the story of, uh, of the people in the sanatorium and they are kind of like a microcosm for Europe. Europe at the time uh, that this uh, novel is set and I think it's set before the First World War. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, yeah, I will read this probably in a couple of months um, because I don't think I can do two Thomas Mann novels in a row right away. Um, and then another one is Rainer Maria Rilke, Die Aufzeichnungen des Malte Lauritz Brigge. And this translates to The Notebooks of Malte Lauritz Brigge. And it's from 1910. Uh, you can tell I'm kind of jumping with the time order. I changed that with the other novels, but with the German ones I'm kind of all over the place actually. And Rainer Maria Rilke is mainly famous for his poetry, but this is his major uh, prose work. 
Um, and I think it's semi-autobiographical, so this will be interesting. And then I have a very old, not very old, but an older German classic. And it's by Hans Jakob Christoffel von Grimmelshausen. <laughs> Try saying that ten times fast. And it's called Der Abenteuerliche Simplicissimus, and I think it just translates to Simplicissimus, uh, which is the name of the protagonist. This is from 1669, and it's set in the 17th century as well, and it's set during the time of the Thirty Years' War, which uh, was a uh, war in Central Europe at the time that went from 1618 to 1648 and wiped out a lot of the population of Europe at the time. And I think what was left was afterwards wiped out by the plague or beforehand or both at the same time uh, and famine. So, um, uh, but this is actually a picaresque novel. So I'm sure there's a lot of humor in it. So it will be um, interesting to see how I'll deal with this one. Um, and again, it's quite long, so we'll see how I do with it. Um, and then I have a poetry collection, um, and this is by Paul Celan, and it's called Moon and Gedächtnis. So the English title for this is Poppy and Memory, um, and this collection deals with the Holocaust. And there's this story that Paul Celan presented his poetry first in the um, famous literary group uh, 47 in Germany and there was a post-war literary group um, and that it was not well received there and that they actually compared the manner in which he was speaking to Goebbels, the propaganda minister of the Nazi regime. Um, now I've also read elsewhere that this is not quite true and that actually his poetry was well received within the group so I don't know which one is true um, but it's certainly interesting to um, think that what I now consider such an important collection of poetry might have not uh, be taken seriously right from the beginning by other um, important literary figures in Germany at the time. And um, yes, it will be, will be interesting. I think this is very... It's, it's not easily accessible poetry and it obviously... Uh, stealing was a very heavy subject, so I'm, I'm definitely going to take my time with these. Um, what I usually do with poetry is read it um, two to three times every poem just to, to get a better idea of um, the poem, uh, just because I'm not that great with reading poetry and so it takes me a bit longer. Um, so yeah, and then I have one a final um, book by a German author and that is Heinrich von Ofterdingen, which is the title. Um, and the author is Novalis. And this is part of the um, German Romanticism movement. And it was actually published posthumously in 1802. And I know that a blue flower plays a big role in this. And that it's like a setup for a lot of the romantic symbolism and things like that. Um, so um, this will be interesting also to to read from that sort of viewpoint of the um, the period of the literary period that is German Romanticism. So this was the first section of books, and these are um, all the books by uh, German authors that I would like to read. Um, but I also have a lot of English classics on this list, uh, which I'm uh, gonna get into now. And the first is, or are, I should say, The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Now this was first published in 1390 and uh, as far as I know it's about um, a people that are on a pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral and um, they tell stories to each other during that time. So it's all these stories and um, as far as I can tell it's uh, written in verse. Um, so um, I think this might take me <laughs> some time as well, but it's an important uh, early English classic and so I definitely want to get to this one. I then have um, two plays that are um, part of the Renaissance drama. So um, we have this huge bind up on the Renaissance drama. It's an anthology of plays and, and entertainments of the time. 
Uh, my boyfriend got this for one of his seminars back when he was um, studying English. Well, he still is because he's getting a PhD in English literature, I should say. But um, he got this when he was, uh, I don't know, getting his bachelor's or master's degree. And there's two plays in here in particular that I would uh, like to read. Um, the and they're both from 1592, actually. Uh, one is The Spanish Tragedy um, by Thomas Kidd. And apparently it's the first revenge play, so this should be interesting. And it was also apparently very influential in the development of Elizabethan uh, drama. And the other one is Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. Um, now, I think probably most of you are familiar with some version of the Faustus story. Um, it's basically about a pact with the devil, um, and I've read uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's version, so the German equivalent, um, his play Faust, and that is from 1808 though, so um, somewhat later. And it will be just interesting to look at this and look at similarities and differences between the two plays. So um, yes, um, this is another one of those early uh, English plays that I would like to read. And then, of course, uh, you can't go without the bard himself, uh, Mr. Shakespeare. So um, I will also want to read some of um, William Shakespeare's plays that, um, as of now, I haven't read. Now, I've read a few of his plays so far, and I'm currently reading his sonnets, although <laughs> that has been an ongoing endeavor for quite some time. Um, and the plays I would like to read are The Merchant of Venice, um, which is the earliest on my list. That's the one from 1596. And then I have never read Othello from 1603, nor Macbeth from 1606. And I feel like especially Othello and Macbeth are like two of his big iconic plays. They're very well known. And uh, so I'm not going to talk in more detail about these, but um, these are the Shakespeare plays I would like to to get to. Um, and then I have some other, sorry, I kind of, <laughs> I'm swaying back and forth here, but I have to grab the books. Uh, I have another big um, English classic that I want to get to, and that is Paradise Lost by John Milton. Um, now this is, um, of course, an epic poem, and it's basically the story of the fall of man and the struggle between God and Satan over the destiny of mankind. Um, so the big questions. <laughs> and um, this has influenced, I think, so much literature going forward that I really want to read this to, to have a better grasp of what came afterwards. And so this is on my list as well. And uh, then I have one final English classic and it is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. So, um, sue me. Yeah, I've never read Frankenstein. Um, I mean, I roughly know the story. I've never watched a complete film of it either. Um, but it will be interesting to, to read this book finally. Um, the original version is from 1818 and what I hadn't realized before but what I found out when I looked it up now is that it was originally published anonymously and Mary Shelley didn't put her name to it until um, a later version of it came out in 1823. And yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to finally read this. So yeah, this is my last of the English classics. Um, and then I have um, two other big classics and those are the Greek classics and you might know what's coming now. Uh, it's Homer. And I haven't read um, the two texts that we have of Homer. So I haven't read the Iliad and I haven't read the Odyssey. Um, and I do want to read these two texts. Now, for some reason I would prefer to start with the Odyssey, but I know if you go with the storyline, the Iliad comes first. So if any of you have read both of these, maybe let me know if it's important to start with the Iliad to, to make more sense out of the Odyssey because that might influence how I in what order I pick these up. So if you have any help on that, um, please let me know. And 
Then I also have some French classics. And the first one I'd like to mention <laughs> again is a chunkster. And that is because it's actually five novels uh, in one. And it's Gargantua and Pantagruel by Francois Rabelais. And I'm hoping I'm not going to butcher the French names that are about to come. Um, and this is actually the story about two giants. So Gargantua is a giant and then Pantagruel apparently is his son and also a giant. And this is supposed to be really satirical. So I'm, I'm just curious to see what it's going to be like. I don't know a lot going into it, but I know it's one of the big classics. So um, this is one I would like to check off my list going forward. And then the next one I have started uh, to read already. And this is uh, Denis Diderot, Jacques the Fatalist. And um, I have been wanting to read this ever since I was a teenager. And I don't know, I read... Um, a short excerpt from uh, a historical novel that dealt with Denis Diderot where he was one of the protagonists and Denis Diderot has also done a huge encyclopedia um, during his lifetime that he worked on and the novel I think was about that and ever since then I've, I've, I've been wanting to read something by him and um, the story is I would say somewhat in the or I wouldn't just say it, it's also <laughs> mentioned in the footnotes, is somewhat in the vein of Tristram Shandy, which by the way I haven't read either and should be on this list, but um, <laughs> I can only read so many books before I turn 30, so uh, I will leave that one for afterwards. Um, but it's sort of in the, diff in the similar vein in that we're supposed to hear this love story of Jack, uh, who's a servant, and he's telling this story to his master, except he's never really getting to the story and he the, the novel goes off on all these tangents and it's really a fun and enjoyable so far and actually quite a quick read so um, nothing to be intimidated by actually and apparently it's an exploration of destiny and free will and I get that because Jack always says oh it's just sort of sort of along the line of the meaning it's written in the stars and he does have no control over what happens um, so yeah, it's an interesting uh, reading experience so far and I'm really enjoying it. And then we have two big chunksters and I don't know that I will finish the next one uh, by the time I'm 30 or whether I will just start it. And that is Victor Hugo, Les Miserables. And this is one of those huge classics that I think are not difficult to read in the sense but just intimidating because of the sheer size of them. I think this edition clocks in at what is it? <laughs> 1463 pages and um, I want to at least get started with this novel and maybe ideally finish it by the end of the year but we will see what happens but I want to start it before I turn 30. Um, who knows maybe I'll get completely sucked into it and, and finish it. Uh, in one quick swoop. Who knows what's gonna happen. And the other big one, and you might be able to, to guess what's coming now as well, is um, Marcel Proust, uh, In Search of Lost Time. I'm not gonna attempt uh, the French title. And I only want to get started with this. And by getting started, I mean read the first volume, which is Swan's Way. And I think that in itself already has like 600 pages. Um, so this is the bind up of the first two uh, novels in the um, in this uh, in search of lost time, um, and yes, I want to read um, I want to read Swan's Way um, this year, and then continue on. I think I have started reading this last year. I've read like the first twenty or so pages, uh, and then gotten off track, but I've really enjoyed what I've read so far. And so I'm looking forward to reading more of this. We're getting closer towards the end. Um, I have two Italian classics that I have on my list. Um, again, um, sort of big ones. Um, and maybe you can uh, take an educated guess what they will be, but I'll just tell you all right away anyway. So um, the first one being uh, The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Now, the edition that I'm holding up only has the first part, the Inferno, in it, but I have another 
edition um, that has all three parts, so the Purgatory and um, Paradise as well. Um, but this, it, I'm just holding up this um, edition because it has um, the Italian and the German version alongside. So um, I took Italian when I was uh, in high school and I took Italian classes at university as well, but I've <laughs> forgotten most of it. But it will be interesting to maybe read some short passages of this in uh, the original Italian. I will at least attempt to do that as I read the German version alongside it. And um, yeah, this is from 1308 and it's um, Dante's way into hell and back. Um, and I think he's in search of Beatrice, um, his love who has passed away. So um, I'm curious to see what I will think of this huge classic. And then the other classic, and that comes in uh, two books the way I own it, is Giovanni Boccaccio's uh, Decameron. Decameron? How do you pronounce it in English? The Decameron? I think it's the Decameron. And I've said it so many times now that it's starting to sound weird, so I'm going to stop. Uh, this is from 1353, and from what I can tell, it's uh, about ten noblemen and women who are seeking refuge from the plague uh, in a remote villa and they are spending the, I think it's the next 10 days, um, telling stories in turn. So everybody, of um, everyone tells a story each day, so all in all it's a hundred stories in here. And I think this might be something to read in between other books, to read some stories every here and there, um, every now and then. Uh, and slowly get through this one, uh, which I think will help with uh, some of the, the chunkier books on this list. Even though it's chunky in itself, so I don't know if that logic is off. And yeah, now I have some books that I would probably classify under modern classics, um, if I have to like make up a category for them. And these are from different countries, I'm just gonna uh, mention that as I go along. Um, and the first one is Rabbit Run by John Updike. Um, and can you believe that this book is from 1960? I looked it up and I, I didn't think it was that old yet. Um, I mean, that old, it's not... But it's more than 50 years, so that was just kind of surprising to me. And this is the first part in the Harry Rabbit Angstrom series, which I think is, is quite iconic and I think brought John Updike's fame up to a new level at the time that he wrote these and published these. And um, I have all four of the novels, um, three are in this bind up and then the last one, Rabbit at Rest, is in a, a separate bind up. Um, but I think I'll just start with the first one and I hope I'll enjoy it and uh, continue on with the series afterwards. And then just uh, the next book is just two years later and it's another US American classic. And that is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Casey. And I've watched the movie adaptation of this, the one with Jan Jack Nichols. Uh, I don't know if there's any other one. Actually, I don't think there is. And and I loved the movie. I thought it was really, really great. Um, but I wanted to let some time pass before I re read the novel afterwards. And, and it's been a few years now since I've watched the movie. And I think um, I'm ready to dive into the novel. Uh, and yeah, this is set in a mental hospital and um, it would just be interesting to um, see this play out in the original literary format um, of the novel. Um, then I have um, a book by a Spanish author and this is Jorge Semprun and the English title is What a Beautiful Sunday and this is from 1980. And Jorge Sempun had quite the life. Um, he was a communist in Spain and he was fighting against the uh, Franco regime. Um, but when Franco finally gained power, I should say he was fighting to prevent the Franco regime. But when Franco regained power, he had to um, leave Spain. And so he was uh, exiled to France where he then became part of the resistance against Nazi Germany. Um, 
but he was eventually um, arrested by the Germans and they took him to the concentration camp Buchenwald and, and what a beautiful Sunday is actually um, the story of one day in Buchenwald and starting from this point on uh, it tells the story of Jorge Sempun's life so this is autobiographical and I think this is going to be quite the story to read and uh, not an easy one at that um, but I've been wanting to read this for or I've had this book I should say for more than 10 years now I've been wanting to read it ever since so I think it's time I finally get to it the next one is by a Polish author and I'm gonna butcher his name. I looked it up before and then I watched a video of an interview saying his name multiple times but I still can't do it. It's um, Andrzej Szy <laughs> It's Andrzej Szypiorski and I'm sorry for butchering that and this is from 1986 and it's called The Beautiful Mrs. Seidman and um, it's set at the same time more or less than Jorge Sempron's book. It's set in 1943 in uh, Nazi-occupied Warsaw and it tells the story of um, Mrs. Seidman. Now this is fiction, um, whereas Jorge Sempron's uh, book is autobiographical, this is uh, a novel. Um, and Mrs. Seidman is Jewish but she is blonde and she has blue eyes so she manages to slip underneath the Germans, uh, the Nazi Germans radar and she passes as the wife of a Polish officer actually for a while until she no longer does because um, somebody recognizes her and um, has her arrested and the story goes on from there. So um, yes, another book that I've been meaning to read uh, in forever and so yeah, I'm finally making it a, a priority. And then I have one final book and I don't know if you can even call it a modern classic yet because it's so recent, it's from 2005. So um, it's just, what, 14 years old now? And that's The Sea by John Banville. And this won the Man Booker Prize um, in the year it was published. And I think in the year it was published in 2005, yeah, it went on to win that year's Man Booker Prize. And um, I do want to read most of the Man Booker winners at some point and um, this is one I've been meaning to read for quite a while, it sounds really interesting. And it's about Max Morden and he travels um, back to a seaside he was at when he was a young child and he travels back there after having recently lost his wife and by being back in this place he remembers the past and the experiences he made uh, during his childhood at the seaside and a death uh, that he encountered there and he actually starts to realize new truth about the past and that just sounds very intriguing to me so um, Yes, this is uh, the last book on that list. Now, if you have paid close attention and counted all the books, which kudos to you if you have done that, um, I'm up to 29 books actually. So there's one more. And this is what you probably call the big kahuna. Um, and this is the Bible. I, um, myself, I'm not religious. I wasn't brought up religious. I'm, I was born in the former GDR, so German Democratic Republic, and uh, religion was actually frowned upon there. And so I didn't grow up with it and I, I, I don't connect to religion in that way. But I have every respect if you're religious and I think that's great. Um, I think religion can offer a lot to people and um, yes, uh, I just wanted to, to make that clear. Um, but I've never read the Bible. I've read short pa passages. I had a children's Bible as a child, if that makes sense, even though I wasn't raised religiously. Um, and so I know some of the major stories. And when I lived in the US, I lived with uh, a religious um, host family. And so I went uh, to church with them every now and then. So I have 
some rough knowledge. But I want to read large passages of the Bible and I'm not going to read the whole book, at least not right now. Um, Rather, what I'm doing is um, using Steve Donahue's Western Starter Kit video on the Bible and reading all the passages, passages he recommends in that video. And I will link that video down below. Um, uh, so go check that out if you, if you don't know it yet. And um, I think the Bible is not just as a religious text, but even as a literary text, it's so important because this is going to help me with a lot of the other books I want to read. I think this is going to particularly help me with Paradise Lost and with the Divine Comedy. But even with a lot of contemporary literature, um, so much draws on the Bible and on these stories. And I think it's, as a student of literature, it's so important to have this knowledge. And I think it's just a vital text to, to understand a lot of literature. And I do want to read this, uh, um, or most of the Bible, um, over the course of the next nine months. And I think I'm gonna split this up and read parts every month of it, um, and slowly get through this, because I think you really have to take in this information uh, in order to apply it later on and, and to, to remember it properly. Um, so yeah, this will definitely be uh, an important reading experience for me. So yes, those are the 30 books I want to read before I turn 30. Um, let me know which of these books you have read, um, which of these maybe I should prioritize, although I do want to get to all of them. And please let me know if you would like to read along with me for any of these books. Um, I will say for January I have started uh, Buddenbrock's uh, Jacques the Fatalist, um, Dr. Faustus by Marlowe, and I will also read in January Heinrich von Ofterding by Novalis. Um, but for any of the other books um, I would be uh, up for that. I will definitely read one flew over the cuckoo's nest in February, but I haven't set all the other books yet uh, in stone or anything like that. Um, so let me know if you're interested in that. And yes, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. If you want to subscribe to this channel or comment down below, uh, feel free to. Um, and again, yeah, I would just be interested to know which of these have you read uh, and hopefully loved. So bye guys!